Welcome and good evening. My name is Anthony Madgett. I'm the uh, medical director of the Office of IRB Administration at UC San Diego with responsibility for oversight of human subjects research and also by training a pediatric otolaryngologist that's a head and neck surgeon. And the perspective I bring is from a regulatory ethical perspective from IRBs, which I'll talk a little bit about, about why we have IRBs and how they protect individuals and really sort of lay the foundation for how complex consent is in genomic research and genetic clinical results as well as research because how dynamic the field is in trying to describe a tremendous body of knowledge both to providers, care providers, as well as patients and subjects in research settings. So why have an IRB? If you talk to any investigator, they wish you probably didn't have an IRB. It's always looked at as more of a challenge as hoops to jump through before somebody could conduct research involving human subjects, but really is integral to the ethical and regulatory performance of clinical research. I don't need to go into the historical perspective other than to say, without question, there's more than a hundred year history of inappropriate, at times, treatment of research subjects. So the hallmark is following World War II when the evaluation of research that was conducted by Nazi Germany really brought to light how inhuman people can be to one another, oftentimes with the guise of doing research. The United States at the same time was conducting research in malaria, for instance, intentionally infecting individuals, allowing them to be infected to see the natural history. In the United States, even post-World War II, we have fairly significant history of events that really led to the importance of providing regulatory oversight for human subjects research. Every institution of academia that performs research or any institution that conducts human subjects research has to have an IRB, or now we can actually rely on one another. But it's really incumbent upon researchers to perform an ethical way in response to regulatory requirements. And for any study that's involved with federal funding, it's a mandate that it has to be reviewed by an IRB according to very specific federal regulations. The mission of the IRB is really for compliance for federal policy that has evolved over the past 40 and 50 years to conduct research in an ethical manner with a background of truly historical miscues. And we learn from those things. They're not good in any way, shape, or form, but it really brings to light how important it is to be very sensitive to what happens with human subjects. It really put it upon researchers to conduct research in a way that you can get the most information with the least risk to the subjects. And consent is really the hall piece. The keystone in human subjects research is to really make sure that a human subject is giving informed consent. That being said, there are situations where actually consent can be waived, but there's very specific regulatory guidance in terms of what situations that can happen. And the bottom line is that we want to protect human subjects. And it may seem very cumbersome for those who have applied to an IRB for approval before starting a research project, but that really is the fundamental reason that IRBs exist, is to protect, protect human subjects. We all conduct research in science exploration with the intent of improving society, improving the well-being of humankind, but we have to be sensitive to the fact that we can't sacrifice people along the way, which unfortunately has been the case at various times. The cornerstone of IRB decision making is this three-part matrix. Beneficence really is where you have to look at the risk-benefit analysis of a study prior to its being conducted. That may even include the experimental de design. And some people question whether an IRB has the right or the scope to actually look at experimental design, but oftentimes that is part of the review because you want to make sure that the design is consistent with the science. Because when we think about risk in research, we think of physical risk, potentially psychologic risk, but there's a risk of wasting people's time. There is a risk of people having social negative implications or financial loss because of participating as a human research subject. So it's just not physical or psychologic harm that we're concerned about. We look very closely at the qualifications of the principal investigator. And I have to say, as science has moved forward and human experimentation has become more complex, there are times that we will ask that additional investigators be placed on a protocol to make sure that there's appropriate expertise, not only with the science, but also to anticipate any negative reactions that it can occur as a result of being a research subject. When you speak about justice, this is both from being very inclusive, and we're very sensitive to the notion that there has been a history of be tremendous selectivity in the type of subject that was included in trials. And what, an example specifically is cardiovascular research in the United States, where you can look at decades of cardiovascular research where the predominant profile of the research subject was a white male. 
And we know, in fact, that because of differences, it could be socioeconomic, they could be access to care, that there are differences amongst the various segments of our society. So we have to be inclusive. It's very important to do that. We here are in San Diego. It's incumbent upon us to make language not a barrier to access to research. And if we're going to conduct a clinical study, not only for the science perspective, but also for inclusion and making sure that the results are relevant for the breadth of our society, we have to make sure that we have a low threshold for enrolling non-English speaking subjects to make it equitable and accessible to our society. And the, the focus of this talk really is respect for persons. And that comes down to informed consent. When you're speaking about a child, and I think tonight we're going to be talking about children, when you talk about genetic or genomic testing, that there's significant implications for the young child who doesn't have the ability to consent for themselves. We may not know the implications of a genomic result at this time that may have implications for 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So informed consent for the adult, parental permission for the child, as well as assent. And that means that even a child who's not a majority, typically more than seven years of age, less than 18, we have to obtain adolescent assent or child assent for those subjects to the best of our ability to explain to them what's being asked of them. And that cannot be ignored. Again, there are times that's waived based upon the complexity or the urgency of the study, but it is incumbent upon research to take that into account when you're dealing with subjects who are minors. So there are protections beyond the IRB, and this I think is very relevant not only for research gen genetic and genomic testing, but also for clinical testing. For those of you who aren't familiar, HIPAA is something that was implemented in the late 1990s. And this basically protects your medical data that goes in and out of a medical record. So I'm sure when you stand in line at the pharmacy and you have that red line that says, please stand behind this line because of HIPAA concerns, that there are factors in terms of genetic and genomic results, especially if they're part of your medical record that are protected by HIPAA. And there can be very severe regulations for breach of data and protections that individuals have, one of them being that a patient is allowed and is, has authorization to find out who accessed their data. It's, it can be very cumbersome. It may not actually play out as well in reality, but that's one of the components. What we're going to talk about tonight also is how much can you do upstream as far as informing an individual of what their genetic or genomic results are going to be, but how can you protect that individual once the results are known? And GINA is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act is very specific. And what this means is that the results of genetic testing cannot be used to deny you health insurance. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any role in protecting you from being denied disability, life, or long-term care insurance. So there are gaps in GINA legislation, which is something that's being actively looked at from a legislative standpoint. And then COC, or Certificate of Confidentiality, this is actually a determination that's provided by the National Institutes of Health, whereby research results are protected from uh, legal implications in many uh, situations. A, a very interesting example of this is somebody who wants to do research in criminal behavior, they actually can get a certificate of confidentiality, so they may not have to report a felony or crimes that are committed by their research subjects in order to conduct the research. Obviously, there are thresholds you can't cross, if there's an individual who's in imminent harm, that trumps, so to speak, the certificate of confidentiality. But this comes into play that there's a genetic result that's a result of research. It could be protected, for instance, so your employer couldn't access it necessarily without your permission or ability to get a job or get other types of insurance. The, the common rule is what guides IRBs. This is a, a federally dictated list of rules that oversee human subjects research. There are multiple federal agencies that abide by the common rule. Interestingly enough, the FDA isn't a complete adopter of the common rule, but there's an active process right now to get the FDA on board. So it would be uniformity across all federal agencies that are involved in human subjects research. This common rule was just recently revised to make it more facile in terms of human subjects research, to make it more practical and uh, more easily implemented. Some of the consent changes, which I think are very relevant, are that you have to address the fact of whether or not you're going to return clinically relevant results. So I think this is very important, especially talking about genetics, genomics, that if those types of assessments are part of a clinical trial, you have to make it known to the subject whether they're going to get those results back. 
And, and that's really important. You just can't, you may not decide to return them, but the person has to know whether you're going to return them or not and how you're going to provide information to support that. And very specifically, it addresses whole genome sequencing with a statement that the research will, will not, or might involve whole genome sequencing. So I think this is also a discussion we're going to have later in terms of the implications of whole genome sequencing, as well as the potential of some uh, issues in terms of reporting. So we've really seen a change in the scene in terms of human subjects research. I think those are listening to this uh, presentation may understand the study of Henrietta Lacks. Um, it was an unfortunate individual in, in Baltimore who was the subject of a research, was not aware of it. And tremendous studies continued for decades with the tissue that she inadvertently or without consent donated to science. And this really has caused individuals to look much harder on how people's specimens, how their data is used downstream, what is informed consent. And then being at the University of California, San Diego, we cannot ignore what role the University of California has played throughout the nation. And I think people always talk about California being the leader for good or for bad. I'm a, more on the good side. But this is one instance where there was a patient at one of the University of California medical campuses who had a particular uh, cancer and was asked repeatedly back to that campus to give specimens in an ongoing manner. That individual was never told they were asking to be to returned to the campus for clinical purposes. They were told it was for clinical purposes. They were not told that it was for research. And it was only when somebody almost mistakenly told them that, oh, we'd like you to come back because your, your cells, your condition is very interesting, that they actually sued the University of California. Interestingly enough, the, the courts determined that that patient had no reason to have access to any of the financial benefit, which did come from their tissue ultimately with the science that was done with it. But what they did find in favor of the complainant was that they were not adequately informed, that the individual conducting the research had a conflict of interest that was not disclosed to the subject. So what are the specific challenges posed by genetic research? I'll extend that to genome sequencing. Really, how do you provide adequate informed consent where you're going to test for 1,000 genetic variants and the potential implications? I think that's, I, I think we will, we will talk about that, whether that's even possible. What do you do with, when the results come back? Are they clinically relevant at the time? Do you have a counselor who's available really to explain that either to the subject themselves, their family, or if you return the results to their family physician, are we overburdening family physicians that shouldn't be expected to have the expertise of a genetic counselor. What are the impacts on patients and their families? We talk about the fact that if you determine that a particular patient has a certain genetic condition that may not be symptomatic, what is the responsibility of the researcher, the clinician, or that patient to inform their first or second degree relatives? That's something that we need to address. And then there's the confidentiality. And then finally, the world is changing where that line between consumer science and clinical science and research science starts to become a bit confusing. So when we look at laboratory tests that are conducted as part of research, we determine was it done in a certified lab? Was it done in a clinically clinical grade lab? And then if it is, shouldn't you have an obligation to report those results back? And the American College of Medical Genetics has a list of 59 genetic conditions that really investigators and clinicians are recommended to return those results to the individual because there's a sense that they're actionable, that you can actually do something about those results. When would you not potentially consider returning results if there's no th test that you could validate? So if you have a research test for a particular condition and it's positive, but it's not done in a clinically valid way, is there another gold standard test that you could use to confirm the diagnosis is an example. And then the whole issue about concerns about notification for clinical correlation. You know, how, if you have a result now that you may not actually know how it presents clinically, but with ongoing acquisition of information, maybe that five years from now, we're gonna know how that particular genetic profile presents clinically, what's your responsibility for keeping in touch with those individuals and then letting them know? One of the, the more fascinating aspects is this notion of an open futures argument, which is an ethical dilemma. This is specifically has to do when you're doing genetic or genomic testing in a minor that doesn't have any right to say yes or no. A newborn can't say, I want you to do my whole genome. And this gets down to 
what are you doing to that child if you give their parent a result that at this point may not be actionable? They may treat them differently. It may close off opportunities down the road because they think there's some impact on their life expectancy. So this obviously is very dynamic, but it needs to be addressed because once you've disclosed a result, you can't take it back. And I think that's something that we have to be very cognizant of. And in terms of direct-to-consumer, I think everybody is very familiar with direct-to-consumer genetic testing sequencing. And this really does become an experiment of an N of one, as we say in science, where there's one subject, it's that person getting the result in the mail. What are they gonna do at their home when they find out that they do or do not have a risk for a particular condition? How does that align with the knowledge they have, what they may do to act upon that? And then finally, I think we can all agree that human subjects research is a lot more complex than it used to be. Um, even 30 years ago with clinical trials, you would set out with a certain hypothesis, you would do your trial for a defined period of time, you would get your outcomes, and then any data or specimens generated from that study may be destroyed at the conclusion of that study. But really more times than not, clinical trials include data that's saved that can be aggregated later, whether it's for a meta-analysis where you combine data from multiple studies, or whether it's just used for a down-the-road analysis. And it's very common that in clinical trials that involve collecting specimens, that those specimens may be saved for future research. So that really is something that needs to be taken into consideration. And then we really have patients who become subjects. And that whole notion of that line between who is a patient, who is a research subject, I think really is very exciting because I think as people involved in medicine, we really have to sort of view everybody who walks in our room may be the the patient today, but they're the research subject of tomorrow. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Hightower. Great, that's excellent. I know as a, as a group, uh, we sought to circulate some questions ahead of time to get the conversation started. I think one um, that Shane and Illumina had proposed, and might take a little bit of explanation, um, just to bring everyone up to speed, is, is the question is, is the use of institutional review boards to approve secondary research aligned with patients' expectations around privacy and patients' right, or at least their expectation to have control over the use of their data? I don't know if someone wants to break down just secondary research aligned or any other concepts in there um, in addressing that. So before I get started, I just want to introduce myself. <laughs> Maybe um, my name is Pratish Satin. I'm, uh, I lead the medical affairs team for Illumina uh, in, the, in the Americas region. The America region includes US, Canada, and uh, Latin America. And earlier we mentioned a lot about IRB and uh, how we interact with IRB on a regular basis is that my team is involved in evidence and education with big and small institutes across, across the country. And when I say big and small, we will have institutes like UCSD or MSKCs and MD Andersons of the world, which has a full, fully developed IRB. Uh, but also we work with small practices like community practices where a lot of these patients are seen may not have, his, have the sophisticated uh, IRB structure that's needed for some of these questions. And I want to slowly go into that question of the secondary research, because in a day-to-day -day basis nowadays, a lot of these patients are getting tested for you know, identifying therapy for cancer, uh, identifying therapy for other diseases. But the problem is that what was the consent that was meant for that specific patient uh, both in an academic institute, they might have already have a well consented form where the challenge is different, but in a centralized IRB in a community setting, it's a very different question. So without knowing the IRB challenges, it becomes very difficult to communicate or understand the results and it becomes very relevant in the real world because right now, FDA is looking at real world data for drug approvals. So there is a approval consequence also associated with this data that's being emerging. But if the question for the IRB is not taken care, um, that becomes a bigger challenge. The question is, is community IRB the right resource for those situations? Or a IRB that's actually answering some of the questions on a case by case is the right option? Because again, it's we don't know the, some of the situations we come across because genomics has opened a very unique space. We are looking at 20,000 genes for a newborn. We don't even know some of the implications of those genes now and in the future. 
So how are we going to answer those questions, and how relevant is an IRB conversation 20 year, now compared to 20 years in the future? So how can we answer those questions becomes a very relevant topic, and which institution is involved in these conversations becomes another topic. So it will be great to share and understand each of our thoughts there and kind of see how how can we answer these questions in a very ethical and uh, logical manner so that we can not only answer the questions for today but also for future. And, and I want to I wanna thank you for joining us on the panel. And I want to thank you for that introduction and also framing. Um, and it really speaks to, I think, the strength of the panel, right? Um, from having a representative from Illumina and a representative from UCSD, uh, IRB, uh, and then uh, the audience as well. And <laughs> sorry for interrupting, Anthony. I'll let you go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say, it really is, I mean, one way you can look at that, if it's data obtained for clinical purposes, then it could fall under HIPAA. So the, just for the release of information, if it's a matter of having to go into a medical record. I think when you talk about consent, I think people are more aware of the fact that even for clinical studies now, there can be a research consent associated with it. And one of the other ways that this type of data is managed, at least for right now, whole genome sequencing would be considered de-identified unless it was associated with typical identifiers, whether that's your name, your address, your social security number, your birthday. So one way to approach it is if the results are completely stripped of standard HIPAA type identifiers, then it could actually potentially be considered not human subjects research. Where it does get more complicated, though, to really make that genetic information meaningful, you want clinical data. And, and to do that, oftentimes you have to either get information directly from the patient as a subject, as somebody who's identifiable, or go into their medical record, so then it would then move over to the IRB. And, and oftentimes, so we talked about most of the regulations are specifically enforceable when it's federally funded. But most academic institutions will use the same standard for research. And one of the stopgap measures is that when you go to either submit your paper for publication or for presentation at a meeting, regardless of the funding source, either the editor or the program manager for that meeting is going to ask whether or not you went through an IRB, because they don't want to find themselves in a situation where they're using data inappropriately. Yeah, and then I, I just want to also add the community perspective that, um, you know, a lot of these institutes don't have the IRB structure. What they are trying to do have a centralized IRB with, with, through a third party. So rather than having an individual IRB for each of these institutes, they will have a centralized IRB. And these institutes actually join that IRB for that study so that the study can be conducted in a meaningful way. So that's another perspective for institutes that doesn't have that kind of a structure in place and facilities in place because sometimes these subjects might be seen in a practice with two doctors or three doctors. They don't have more than what it takes to take care, take care of the patients. So having that research so, you know, becomes very difficult for them. But from an FDA as well as regulatory perspective, that data is very important because that is the real world where a lot of these patients are seen on a day-to-day -day basis because this might be a practice somewhere in the middle of nowhere where that's the only hospital in the near facility. So that becomes a very big challenge and there is a lot of you know, patients who are seen in those neighborhoods where we need to understand the data but also understand the critical question about IRB. Right, and they, this proliferation of commercial IRB, so there, you can either have an academic institution or research institution whose IRB can oversee research for other institutions, or their freestanding commercial IRBs, which are outstanding, that are populated by experts. Again, not only practices unaffiliated with universities, but actually universities more and more are using commercial IRBs because they do have tremendous resources, a depth of expertise. And one step further is the National Institutes of Health has now mandated a single IRB review for a study that's conducted at multiple sites. And the reason for that is, IRBs are made of people. We know that people are idiosyncratic. And the joke always is, if you want four opinions, you ask four IRBs. So the federal government realized that if you consistently have one IRB for each institution that is involved in a trial that may have 15 to 20 sites, you may get some nuanced differences. And it really is not impractical to have one IRB that is a responsible reviewing IRB for one site and then the others rely upon them. So this really is a move 
that's been a sea change in the past several years. So I think it's, a, it's an exciting move, and I think it really forces us to decide what is important in commenting or applying regulations and what really is more sort of idiosyncratic and just locally driven by culture. Yep. Definitely, that's what we are seeing in the uh, in a space because now even with limited resources, these practices are able to you know, join research and really produce that data which is needed in a large scale because we also need to understand one more thing is that with the advancements in medicine and genomics, our we are identifying drugs which are meant for very small population. There are studies which got approved based on 70 or 60 patients. You know, if every patient becomes a very critical component of that study, because there is currently, uh, there is a study going on for a rare alteration with 78 patients that's being recruited internationally. That is all FDA has demanded for that study, but you know, finding those, Patients is very difficult, and when you find that kind of a patient somewhere in, in any part of the world, it's important to have a centralized IOP to get that patient on the trial and make sure that they are counted because you know you lose 10 patients, you almost lose more than 10% of the total study that's being recruited internationally. So it becomes a very relevant question. I just wanted to add that add that perspective because it's we are coming into an age of drugs being approved where for re very rare indications for the total number of patients, I mean, will be very small and we cannot miss out on in any or every one of these patients as we are thinking about that study. And we've touched on this, I think, indirectly, and that's the issue of, of public trust, right, which is central to all of our, our, our work. I wanted to shift specifically for genomics research um, to say what advice would you give for non-researchers about getting involved in ways that empower researchers to navigate dilemmas that have the potential to undermine public trust? I, I think education really is paramount. And I think in this day and age, we don't need to go too long to discuss what people believe in professionalism and trust in medicine. And I think that's something not only for genomic research, but there's a quite a bit being written now about just trust in medicine in general, because of resource scarcity, as well as financial cost and differences of opinions, basically, what is healthcare? So I think from this perspective, it really starts with education, you know, whether it's in schools or with the public. And I think that to be very transparent, I think is very important to really say what we don't know. And I think that's a lesson we probably have learned from the pandemic that people feel that one week we're being told one thing, two weeks we're being told another thing. And I think the first message that has to be relayed is that what you hear now, we expect it's gonna be different a year from now or two years from now. And if it isn't, that's the surprise. And I think that will be very, very important because people hear about stories of the abuse of data. And I think number one is to impress upon people how dynamic the situation is, expect change. And I think also is to advocate for protections. Gene is a good example of that. It sounds great, but it really has somewhat limited protection, which probably isn't adequate for the breadth of impact that genetic results can have. So I think being proactive, being advocates, is really the most important thing that we can do. It's, it's, it's difficult, I wish we could achieve that for all of society, but I think we have to take that as our responsibility. Yeah, I, I would also stress on the education side of it. Um, again, education is a challenge, especially in a remote setting. You know, we have all moved from real life to the remote uh, situation. It's, it's a blessing in a lot of cases because you can reach a patient who is actually uh, in the other part of the world uh, for recruitment purpose. And if you look at it, um, we have seen a lot of virtual clinical trials being rolled out, even for on you know di very difficult diseases like oncology. Uh, so that is a blessing, but at the same time, it has also made communication very difficult. So having the education in layman terms simple, easy to understand, and sometimes you also have to take a step back and ask the question, is this education too lengthy, which we are not thinking, because sadly our attention span has gone from probably half an hour to two, two and a half minutes. So, you know, we need to understand who our audience is and what we are dealing with when we are 
designing that education module uh, for a specific topic and you know early education i mean as we are understanding the new era i mean this is a sad scenario that some of the doctors need education on genomics because when they were in medical school they didn't have that much education and they had few hours of genomics but genomics is becoming a central part of day-to-day -day patient care so you know when you speak about education it's not just about uh, the patients and the uh, you know clinical research subjects it starts from the clinicians who are conducting this they need to understand and um, be very aware of the clinical importance so that we can actually make sure that they are able to translate to their patients and make it simple enough so that it's it's within that audience so that's that's what i would think about there too because education in this current world is a challenge but also we need to understand the challenge as well as the opportunity that it has given us as, as i said there is so many of these virtual platforms coming up so we need to use technology to to its best to provide that education i'm curious in your ideal world would there be high schoolers or grade schoolers learning about I mean, you know, genomic education definitely should start in a high school scenario because, you know, you have to think. You need to know about your genes, and it basically doesn't mean that you have to go to the advanced education, but the basics of, you know, genomics starts with DNA and RNA. Kids should have enough education in middle school so that they can understand what the DNA and RNA means. And as they go in, we should provide hands-on experience you know, some of these, you know, simple things, right? I mean, uh, extracting DNA out of a strawberry. That's a simple thing that if you teach the kids early enough, they're not gonna forget in for their life. And showing them the diff there is no difference between DNA or RNA from a, you know, early point of life, right? Whether it's a pl plant or an animal, that makes a huge difference for these, uh, these uh, you know school school students because they really can actually make a difference and that will be really impactful as they grow to understand the value of genomics because we cannot have that education in a only advanced stage where everybody who reaches that stage only understand it we need subject patients and as well as future citizens to understand it from the school level so starting early in the middle school and then more focused education in the High school level is what we need uh, if we have to actually really bring that genomic revolution. Yeah, yeah I, I, we could talk a lot about that, which I think it, re it really is an opportunity for, I don't wanna get too philosophical about, but civility. I, I, I think you talk about the commonality between plants and, and humans and other mammals. I think we can talk a lot about how it's really unifying information, which I think is pretty exciting. From a clinical implementation standpoint, Despite the fact we have this proliferation of genetic data, we have a tremendous shortage of genetic counselors who really have expertise. So there's a lot of interest in developing toolkits. And as, as you said, the clinicians are probably the ones who are least apt to really interpret the data for the multiple number of their patients who may come to them with results. So there really is a push to develop automated toolkits for specific scenarios and also even give a plug for telemedicine. That especially in a rural location where you don't have access to genetic counselors, to be able to use communication technology to bring those counselors to where the patients and the subjects are. Definitely, and again, uh, you know, gen uh, genetic counseling is becoming a big challenge with the spread of genetic, uh, genomics data, but at, at the same time, virtual platforms are becoming very effective. I mean, there are nationally renowned institutes that's providing genetic counseling support uh, for the community, so we should leverage those resources to provide that extra education, as you said. I mean, sometimes clinicians are not the best people to provide that education, and again, sometimes it's a limitation in time. They have more patients to see, so obviously they don't have the time, so we need to leverage those tools to uh, maximize the education and provide the education from the right resource. I agree, completely agree with that. Oh, great, well, thank you. Um, we have a, a couple of questions that I think I want to combine in the interest of time and also open up um, for you all to address the parts of the questions that, that, that you think are most per pertinent. Um, <clears throat> one is thinking about a quality IRB review. How would you define that? 
And, and I want to combine that with one of my questions in, in terms of thinking about how should an IRB com be composed and challenges maybe to the current way that we think about it. Um, and that comes from um, uh, Harriet Washington's uh, Medical Apartheid, in which she chronicles <laughs> a lot of the mistakes that have been made in the United States. But one of the things that she proposes is that each IRB com be composed of equal numbers of scientists and of peers of the group who will be asked to participate in the subjects. Um, and so I wanted to, on that, to think about what do you think, do you see as the advantages and disadvantages of that approach? Maybe wrap that in with, with thinking about what defines a quality IRB and IRB review. Uh, so I interestingly enough, the federal regulations dictate what the composition of the IRB should be. The, uh, the actual committee should consist of a scientist, a non-scientist, what we call an unaffiliated member that doesn't have anything to do with the institution. And the non-scientist perspective is to be the representative of the community. That being said, I can say after 20 years of going to IRB, IRB meetings, that's wholly inadequate. And I think that really is a change that we're seeing is that not only to go to great lengths to really have people who are the subject of the research participate on the IRB committee, but be even more involved in the design of the studies and really collaborate with the subjects that you're going to be involving to make sure that the questions the scientists are asking are the ones that society wants answered and that you have absolute buy-in. So I think this is something because I can say that this notion of having a community representative on the IRB committee is wonderful and it's a start. Um, an example in terms of specific vulnerable populations, one are prisoners, in that it's mandated by federal regulations that if you're going to do research that involves incarcerated individuals, you actually have to have a prisoner representative. That's either somebody who had formerly been incarcerated or somebody who has extensive experience uh, working in institutions involving incarceration. And I hadn't really thought about this, but maybe addressing it is, is you know, it, there's always a joke about jury duty, right? And it's supposed to um, function in that way to be a jury of your peers. And I can imagine that it, it, if we were to expand and try to be more inclusive with IRBs, it's a lot of dedicated time that you have to be and willing to do it. And if we're thinking about volunteers being a part of it, I think even our audience feeling sophisticated enough to deal with those questions are all challenges, right? Well, I think that's where the community representative isn't necessarily intended to be a scientist. That being said, I think IRBs are sort of a great sort of secret because we have community members who have served on the IRB, which maybe is not a good thing they've been on for that long, but some for 10, 15 years because they enjoy the conversation so much. And one of my responsibilities has been to recruit not only people from the university to participate, but also community members. And I really can say I have not had one community member who didn't think it was an incredible experience. Um, I'm, if you want to join a committee, please reach out to me. But it really is something where not only do you sort of have discussions with motivated, interested people, but you also get exposed to the latest technology, the latest advances in society and science. Well, great. Yeah, I think um, that's also an opportunity for us to educate and, you know, make sure that we are able to explain the simple science behind this to community and get that inclusion. Because by the end of the day, you know, as scientists, sometimes we are very much devoted to our field and sometimes it becomes harder to actually communicate to the common man and what's the relevance because we need to practice very much and that provides us a real practice to explain what we are trying to do and what our questions are and how it becomes very relevant for the community audience. So it's a practice and education opportunity for us in recruiting because these community members in turn can become our real advocates in the, in the community to actually uh, you know, educate others on this value of this study. So it's a practice for us, it's an opportunity for us to hone our skills, but at the same time develop advocates because let's be very transparent, trials needs more and more people. We are still struggling a lot on the clinical trials part, so definitely we need more inclusion and that's, it starts with education and this is one of the opportunities for education too. I wanna divide the next two group of or two questions into two groups. I think there's one in terms of thinking about access, right, and barriers to care. 
um, with where research goes, right? Who is it applicable to? And then I, I think the other one in thinking about the roles that um, folks who are asking these questions, the scientists, the teams, and also the IRB, in terms of how far is the technology going to go in terms of people's concerns with CRISP or other things of us potentially, or, or as, you know, um, the, sci the science, right, uh, approving or, or carrying out studies that maybe greater society feels uncomfortable. So I think there are a number of questions, but I, I like that idea they fall into those groups, thinking about access and barriers to care, who has access to participate in, in research studies and, and who benefits from those studies than the other ones in terms of the role of the IRB, the role of uh, scientists in terms of thinking what studies may be too much. In terms of access as a research study, I think it's important to broadly include subjects. And I think that begins with where you recruit from, what you do in terms of addressing language barriers, as you mentioned, unusual conditions, rare conditions, that people can live great distance from the investigator to provide for transportation costs and compensation for lost income. So it really is to remove all those barriers. In terms of how far things can go, I think unfortunately we know that anything somebody can think of and do, they're probably gonna do. You're probably gonna find somebody who's going to do it. So it comes down to really protections that regulations legally that you can enforce funding and really have at provide through the professionalism sort of the ethical commitment of scientific organizations to come to some consensus with input from society critically to have input from society and really try to work with governing bodies but also advocate for ethical behavior amongst their investigators because i think it's pretty hard with if the technology is there it's hard to control it. That's right. I mean, technology is growing at a space which we cannot imagine. I mean, um, you know, I was telling earlier that genomes, which was used to cost $2 million, it's available at $200. So, you know, you can have hundreds of genomes done in a single day. That provides the opportunity to have scientific interpretation, you know, CRISPR kind of technology, you know, that makes some of those decisions very difficult because if you test a pre-born child and in the future if CRISPR advances, the question is like, how much are you gonna manipulate the genome to counter the disease? Because we still don't know the you know, extent of this. We are actually starting to scratch the surface at this point. You know, to design some of these questions now, it's a challenge, but we can have to actually have general guardrails and guidelines to be very ethical and make sure that you know we don't promote, but obviously uh, only involve in research that ethically right. But again, the question is gonna keep changing as we uh, come across different technologies and different scientific uh, you know relevance, because you find certain alterations and um, you have you know where in the genome that's causing it. You go in and actually clip it with the CRISPR kind of simple technology. You don't know wherever, where else you have clipped the genome. You know, we think that we know that it's precise, but we are still starting to learn it. So as we, the precision increase, the opportunity increase, we need to relook at these guidelines, be very flexible, but at the same time, keep the North Star, making sure that we know that we are always being ethical based on the scientific principles and the scientific information, which might change in the next 15 years. You know, So we just need to be open, but at the same time, understand what our uh, guiding principles are. Because at this point, it's very hard to make some of these hard and fast decisions and actually follow it up because technology is advancing in a much higher pace than we can imagine. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I didn't say the specifics, but I think they're just topics, uh, specifics that are on folks' minds where questions were specifically asking about CRISPR, <laughs> right? And I think the other one specifically asking about uh, kids that aren't obviously sick as newborns, but what level of testing you should have access um, for that testing. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's that notion about the so open futures argument that makes it very complicated because if you do universal newborn screening, and you identify genetic abnormalities, you may not know if there are environmental factors that actually led to the condition manifesting itself, and that's very complex. So there really is this notion that you have to be very careful 
and that's where parents are given control over their children, but we do respect children's rights. And there are situations where institutions or the government will actually intervene when they think a family is not doing what is going to cause harm to a child. So it really is, I think, a, a fine balance in terms of the information that you obtain and how you're going to use that and return that to the families. Yeah, and again, uh, moving a little bit away from the pediatric research to the adult research, sometimes, you know, screening for, uh, you know, future cancer risk is becoming a um, somewhat of a common practice or at least, you know, a, in the next few years or next five, 10, eight years, you go to the annual checkup and there is a good chance that you are asked to draw an extra vial of blood uh, from healthy individuals to identify your cancer risk. Uh, we have very less tools, even if you know there is an alteration uh, within you to deal with that situation at this point. And sometimes you have to also ask the question from a one single mutation to a fully blown cancer, it might take 30 years. Are you unnecessarily treating these patients if you know that there is an alteration? What is the relevance of the alteration? How long it takes for these alterations to be become clinically significant? So, you know, again, this is a very difficult space, both with pediatric as well as adult, and the amount of data that's gonna come into this space is pretty enormous, and again, the only way for us is to really be flexible, understand the ethical uh, questions as we come across and really deal with it. And again, this is where the IRB needs to have that participation uh, across the community so that they can actually chime in because situations might need the community to chime in and make sure that we are all seeing that uh, you know community aspect to it. So just being flexible and nimble as well as understanding and interpreting the knowledge as, as it comes to us is going to be the key. Yeah, and I think one point I'll address, and it's really an important, the comments are very important, is that the IRB views identifiable data as human subject research. So what that means is if you do a clinical trial and you collect specimens, you generate data, as long as that data or those specimens remain identifiable, it's, there's still a place for IRB oversight. And, and one of the key components of an IRB is that you're supposed to inform individuals if there are any, any new information that comes about while they're a research subject. So even though the intervention of the trial may end, as long as their data is identifiable, or their specimens are identifiable, there's still an open IRB approved protocol that has that requirement to inform individuals that there's information that they need to know about. So if they have a genetic result of uh, undetermined importance, if because of a large study that looks at a database, all of a sudden that data has importance, there may be an obligation to, to, to go and find that person and tell them that what I told you five years ago about this result, we don't know what to do with it. Now we can say there's a 90% chance that if you continue to smoke, you're gonna develop lung cancer rather than keep that from them. Right. And, and um, two, two additional questions. I think one um, you, you addressed that asked about um, genomics research and how does that enhance a need for more specific concerns. I think you talked about that. That was, that was really helpful. I think the other one um, uh, I think really speaks to why I'm so happy that you came and, and broaden, I think, for a lot of folks, our understanding of, of IRBs. You know, so much of what I want the ethics forum to be about is fact-based discussions, but taking things in science that often kind of look like a black box, they happen, but I'm not quite sure, like IRBs, and opening it up, um, even though they're complex. And I think this question addresses that and says, do you believe a research institute should have multiple IRBs so that different community members serve on an IRB be overseen an area that the community community member belongs to in some way. And I think you addressed this in part, but I think since there's still questions out there exactly how this functions, I wonder if you could dive into that a little bit more. Well, yeah, our IBs do that to a certain extent that a large institution will have multiple committees that have specific expertise. We have an oncology committee, we have a neuroscience committee, we have an infectious disease committee. So from, I think what you're saying really makes sense and we probably need to look at not so much being driven by the medical specialty or the area of research, but the people that it affects. And, and I think that is something that we're doing more and more. So we have a pediatric committee, for instance, and the community representatives tend to be parents. We, we don't have children, we probably should, to be honest. We've talked about having adolescents 
and more and more discussion about having the subjects be more active, specifically in reviewing consent assent documents that can continue to be too confusing, too long, and not particularly helpful, but really sort of uh, bringing them more into the review process. That's great. And, and I want to end off on, on um, I guess, a practical question. Question. I should say, I've never had a family member or a friend ask me, should I be part of a study or not? But I always imagine that they might. I don't know if you all have had that experience. But you know, as a researcher, what guides your own personal individual decisions to participate in any given genomic study? If you have, I'm curious. <laughs> Great question and a very <laughs> difficult question to answer there. Because uh, you know, again, as I said, and we thought, you know, we need to actually interpret that from an ethical standpoint, uh, what that question is, rather than you know a family question. Because obviously, when we looked into these studies, we actually thought about that ethical dilemma and uh, you know to frame the study based on you know ethically being the right study. So in my mind, you know that should be the correct way to think about it and correct way to uh, move forward with it. So in my mind, if that study is approved and you understand the clinical relevance, then definitely that uh, that uh, family member should be able to enroll in that study. And again, this is something that's prevent us from having uh, enough people in clinical trials. This is the question that makes it difficult for a lot. I mean, I've seen large institutes uh, you know, in the country, number one cancer centers in the country where they use any, the in-house testing or a, you know, uh, their testing which they use on every patient for um, their patients and sometimes they use um, additional testing uh, from outside for their family members. That's the same ethical dilemma there. Yes, right, you know. So you need to be standardizing it across, uh, you know, bloodlines and making sure that you know you're doing the best for your patients and you know as a researcher you know when you're designing the study you need to ask that question is this the right ethical question to ask from a research perspective and how this question is going to help patients in the future and as long as the answer to those questions are yes i f strongly feel that you know that he or she should be able to answer uh, enroll their family members and it's a vice versa question too you know you should you should ask yourself if this is a study where you have to enroll your family members will you go forward with the study maybe it's a too big question to make sure that you know you check their ethical morality on both sides final word uh, final, but that, that's interesting because the language built in the consents is that you shouldn't feel pressured to respond at this time whether or not you want to participate and we encourage you to speak to your physician or your family members and when that language was created years ago speaking to a family member it was more to get support and get another person's opinion i think what happens with genetic and genomic research is you're asking your family member do you want me to find out this result because it's going to have implications for you which is a very different take on that language yeah, no, that's a really, it's a really good point, and it speaks to uh, the future ahead of us. I want to thank you all for, for joining us. I want to thank you all uh, for a great discussion, and thank you all as well for your questions. All right. Thank you.